Pellet Waggler. Not my strongest subject, but somebody I know really well, Joe Keras, is going to talk us through how to use one of these to great effect at a fantastic fishery, which is Medellin's near Coventry. Right then, Joe. Um, we obviously had a fantastic response from our previous video where we uh, went pace fishing with you yep. and basically in a nutshell you taught me how to pace fish from an A to Z. And I'm going to hold you to a feeder lesson in the same vein as well. <laughs> well, listen, you're welcome to that if I can teach you anything because as we all know, Joe's an amazing angler and commercial carp, I'm not going to say is his speciality because he can fish anywhere and anything but he's certainly in this duo um, the stronger of the two when it comes to commercials and pace were brilliant, um, brilliant yeah. our viewers loved Great it and th thanks very much for, for all the views yep. so we've, what we want to do that kind of in the same format um, but today we're going to talk about pellet waggler fishing and commercials and you know catties and pellets and so Joe um, talk to us about the fundamentals yep. of that kind of fishing so yeah, pellet waggler, mate. I mean, it's just a brilliant method, fundamentally. It's very enjoyable, it's effective. It's just a great approach in the summer. In the summer, in the that's, summer. An, that's an interesting in the summer, yeah. point. April onwards, you've got a great chance of catching a load of fish on a pellet waggler. When they come up in the water. When they're coming up in the water, they're looking up for a bit of sun. From April onwards, we're gonna catch loads of fish on a pellet waggler. There's a load of different things that we've got to consider before uh, we actually get out on the bank fishing. Because it just sounds dead simple, like yeah. method feeder is a method, pellet waggler is a method, yep. uh, like we did with paste, yeah, it's, so, yeah, you just clip a pellet waggler on, yeah. fire pellets out, chuck your pellet waggler at it, and yep. you catch a load of carp. I think... I, I ain't met a method it, yet that were that simple. No, so. it's, the, it's the perfect place to start the floats, because as you can see, I've got loads of different ones. Box full. A box full of different ones, and they've all got a reason, and I think they're broken down into three main categories, I'd say. They've, uh, you've got your crystal type, you've got your foam type, and then you've got these dowel wooden ones that are heavily loaded at the base. And they're the three popular sorts when you're in a tackle shop. And they've all got a purpose, and I think it's important to carry them all. Okay. Um, well, what's the fundamental difference between them then? So the foam is like the ultimate, when the fish are coming to the splash, it's relatively calm, the fish are very visibly high in the water, the foam hits the water quietly, it sits up straight away, it fishes very quickly and very quietly, and that can be really effective when the, when the conditions are like that. And I've got a few different different options. Yeah. These that, are that's unloaded, unloaded uh, and yeah. you've got a little adapter on, yeah. and you've added some loadings, which will we'll go into that because one, yeah. it's, um, it's important, that is. So you've got your foam ones, like I say, hot day, still day, very effective. Then we've got these little crystal ones, I think yeah. these are mugglers, the call from Drennan. Brilliant. And I think this is like a perfect all round in betweener. Okay. So it's not quite a foam and it's not quite a balsa. It's it's somewhere in between. And it's on a, just a, if I was just to pick one to do any pellet waggler fishing, that would be it. Ah. They cast well, they're strong, they're accurate with their loading, they fish easy, they're an easy float to use. They cast brilliant. Brilliant. Um, but then when the wind gets really strong on big open venues, say you're going to Boddington Reservoir, Barston, even here when, at Medellin's when there's a big wind on, then you reach for this kind of float, which is the typical brass loaded dowel sort of float. Yeah. And they're heavy duty, they go up to like 10, 12 grams, you can buy them. You can even buy them bigger in the, the handmade versions. Um, and that's fully loaded, it's, lo it's the a heavy in float, yeah. integrated into but, it. But whereas the nice little foam ones hit the surface and pop up immediately, yeah. that dives down. Because of the way it's made and but the way it's loaded. on the nature of those venues we just mentioned, when you've got big waves and stuff, you do need that to keep that straight line. And we'll talk about the straight line when we get fishing, um, but mm. chucking something like that out in that situation would be no good at all. Because to the average eye, um, there's all these different pellet waggles from different people mm -hmm. uh, and it's immediately a oh, nightmare which one do I pick yep. um, but you'll talk us through the reasons why there are, di there are different yep. ones but you've kind of narrowed it down to three, Think three. Sort of if styles. you had them three styles in your box yeah. of a couple of different sizes you're gonna catch loads of fish just interestingly if, if, I, if I don't own a pellet waggler mm -hmm. 
and I'm right. I need to go. What sort of size would you say somebody would be? A good starting the average. Point. Yeah. Four to six grams is your go-to, I'd say, for most of your pellet waggler fishing. Like here today, four to six, four, five, or six, perfect. Pick a five or a six, you're going to catch loads of fish. Brilliant. Um, and then your smaller sizes are probably a bit more specialist, mugging fish, chucking it cruising fish that kind of thing your three grams and then your bigger ones again your eight gram and above for those big windy days on wild sort of open Every duty stuff. yeah mm. but no they, they all i carry them all i've even got like bigger insert wagglers and, and and longer crystals for when you're hanging a bait but to keep things simple those three yeah for actual pellet wagon fishing where you're in and out they're the ones they're the ones brilliant right so tell us how you rig it up so there's loads of fancy ways of setting up a pellet waggler, but I think um, for me, I've tried it all. I've tried having a, a waggler fixed. I've tried it with big locking shot around the, the line. I've tried all sorts, but for me, this little sit setup and this little system is simple and very effective. And all I've got is uh, two rubber stops, either side of swivel. That is it. As simple, simple as that. that. As simple as that. And I set my rig on these bigger venues, three foot deep, and Rarely change it all. So it's day. just a snap link swivel, so snap you can change, can change like between the floats like you would on the feeder. Yep, it's no different. No different at all. I can pop a foam on. I can pop a the uh, in betweener on. Yeah, and I could pop the balsa on, depending on the conditions on the day. And I just find over the years, I've tried so many different things, and I've confused myself trying to copy other anglers. I had a spell trying to copy Andy Power because he has this little loop and little bit of wire on, and he has a little shock leader and all this. And he's brilliant, he's way better than I'll ever be. But for me, it was just too much faff in my head. I had all these long up clamps tied up because he has long up clamps that, because he doesn't want any like interference down below, but it was just confusing the job for me. And I was worrying about that rather than what I was doing on my box. And I've just found that that is a tangle free setup, allows me to cycle through my floats. I only have to have one rod set up. I don't have to have multiple rods set up. You'll see the yep. top guys have loads of rods set up. I can change my depth if I want to. I can change my float and it is tangle free and effective. So I've got five pound reel line. Okay. Detection, everyone obviously thinks that detection is just a feeder line. It's not, um, it's a fantastic pellet waggler line. That low stretch is very, very effective with a pellet waggler. Brilliant. Um, and you've got that on an 11 foot? Yep, rod. I think it's important to talk about the rod. I've got an 11 foot. Um, there's obviously there's a few different options when it comes to pellet waggler. You could use 11 foot. There's even 10 foot ones now. There's 12 footers, there's even your 13 foot traditional. I think if you're just going out to buy a rod, a pellet waggler rod, get yourself an 11 footer. Middle um, of the rod, middle like of the, the four to six gram floor. Yeah. It's 11 footer, they're comfortable to cast. They'll cope with depths up to sort of four foot, five foot. Um, and I just find that they, I've tried 12s and stuff and they're brilliant, of course they are. But for me, if you're just going to buy one, 11 foot. Brilliant. Just going back, that, back to that line thing, mm -hmm. um, Obviously, I've seen massive pellet wagglers and I've obviously seen really tiny ones. Two gram up to, I think I've seen them up to 12 and 14 yeah. gram. And you mentioned the line size. Obviously, as an angler, mm -hmm. and I ain't done much of it, but I do know that, like all float fishing, and I think in our previous float fishing videos, yeah. um, I've talked about line diameter versus float size for ease and efficiency of casting. Yeah. What because I think most people go, I need carp fishing, I'd have the same size line on my pellet waggler as I would on a method feeder, because I'm fishing for big carp at six or eight pound, so I need six or eight pound or even 10 pound line. Yeah. You've not gone for that. What, what's the uh, reasons behind that? Firstly, five pound detection is very strong. Okay. Um, but there is a caveat to that. If I was fishing these at Boddington with a 10 gram or an eight gram or even a 12 gram, I wouldn't hesitate in using eight pound on the reel because the float carries the line brilliant nicely. But because today it's relatively calm, I do like a five pound line. I think it just matches up nicely. A bit lighter. And I'll fast. have my drag set quite loose yeah. um, and, and, and use a nice soft rod and it's all balanced. It's brilliant. All balanced. Yeah, because it's You it's don't interesting. need thick lines for pellet waggler fishing unless the You're float dictates. Heavy duty, yeah, yeah, fishing heavy as far as you can. Yep catching these massive, massive fish, fish that yep. are really going to put your tackle through the test, but you're happy to catch £200 pound of uh, carp on. If you only give me six or eight pound, I'd, I'd have to use it. But just remember that the heavier you go, the bigger the weight float that you're going to need. Important point. Yeah. Superb. Uh, and that's it. 
I've got 020 hook length for those interested. I've got a size 14 hook on, little bait band, so I can uh, put an 8 quite a pellet small, on. Quite a small hook, that. Yeah, it's, it's a 14 Camasan animal feeder, which is my favourite hook, but it's a small 14. It's more like a 16, I'd say. And a nice small band on the back. And a nice it. small band. I like a small band. That's just a tiny detail. Um, the small band grips the 8mm, or it grips the 6mm nicely. When you're in and out, casting all the time, your pellet can fly off if you get your band size wrong. So I just stick with a little one. Brilliant. Uh, nice and simple. And then there's obviously a couple of things that are probably easily missed, but essential nonetheless. Catties. Yeah, you're not getting far without them. You're not getting far without them. Get yourself some heavy duty style catties. Um, nice big pouch on, because sometimes you're only feeding three pellets, sometimes you're feeding 20 at a time. So you want a pouch that can take it. Something, there's loads on the market, durable elastic, but carry a few. Because it's heavy duty it's fishing. It's heavy duty, you will get through them. And the last thing, if you are in match mode, it's probably different when you're pleasure in, but in your match mode, the last thing you want to be doing is fiddling around fixing them. Pick up another catty and, and, and crack on. Great um, Pellet bander, I'll mention this loads today. I use a tiny band and I just think that that helps me. Put the pellets on, a few spare hook lengths. Jobs are good. Isn't? Pretty simple. Simple stuff. Right, let's get down to the water and uh, see how it's done. Yeah. Right, Joe, so that's the fundamentals of pellet waggler fishing, and uh, you've talked about where we are today. So let's put it into practice. You can show me exactly why there's a difference between doing this right and doing it wrong. Well, it's, this is the enjoyable bit, Mick, but there's loads of things, little details that we can talk about that will hopefully help the viewers uh, catch a few more fish. Without a doubt. It's a complex method. Let's, complex uh, method. let's The see first thing, obviously, is the feeding. The feeding is everything with this method. We're trying to create a momentum of bait going in to keep them fish up in the water. And you've got to keep those pellets going in. So, first thing, little detail, I've got a rod rest straight in front of me. Notice that. Really important. Like Obviously, we waggle fishing, I love to hold the rod, but we need a bit of help every now and again. And this rod rest, perfect height. I can drop it on there when I'm fishing, when I'm feeding, and it just helps me. So, the little process that I've got, I have my float, my pellet in my hand, that's about the distance when I, how I'm going to cast. Yeah, yeah that's, so that's quite a long drop. Don't, yeah, don't have to adjust anything. And the first step is to simply flick that in front of us, just there, on the rod rest, and then start the feed in. Now we've got a bit of a wind on, all of a sudden. Yeah, it's picked up a little bit. And we've got a five gram float on to start with, just to see how we get on. And you'll notice I'm feeding quite regular. And then we cast out, so right on, on top of them pellets. And then the hard work now begins because with that wind, present, we're not going to get long before we the float moves too much to get a bite, if that yeah. makes sense. So it's all about work right now until we catch a fish. So feeding, the float's in, just in front of me again. Busy method, Mick. And I've just seen a fish turning them. Yeah. And then pellets there. In fact, it's still this. He's, he's had a go at the second lot. It's, um, and I think w the word work rate that you've just used is something that obviously I'm quite aware of, but I think it's probably important to emphasize exactly what that means because this is not for a lazy angler type fish. No, it's it? not. It's, um, it's what I call graft. But they're moving, they're moving in them, in that feed, I can see them. That oh, one yeah. the fish then. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it'll take us too long. We just got to work out the feed ratios, how often to feed. You'll notice I twitched the bait back there. That can be a great method, because obviously the best times to get a bite with this method is when your pellet's sinking, rather than it once it's sunk yeah. and down and just sat there. It doesn't look very natural. You'll notice I've got this set about three foot deep, I'd say. Would you say that's three foot? Two I would and say half, it's going foot. up for there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even though most of our bites will be probably in the top 12 inches. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that, because I want my pellet as far away from the float as possible and just flicking through the fish like that. Yeah. So we'll show you the little process. Now the wind's dropped, you'll be able to see it a bit easier. So we fire some pellets in, and then we're trying to chuck to the back edge of them pellets. So visualise where you've done it, just to the back edge. Now I drop the rod onto the rest. Now this is a great time to get a bite. When the float's first, like that. Just like that. <laughs> and that's clearly took that as that pellet's falling. Yeah. And that's quite obvious, and, it, and for me, worth mentioning to everybody that's watching, that the fish are shallow, so I think it would be natural for people to set their depth 
at the depth that they thought the fish were feeding yeah. at. So let's say that we think the fish are between six and 12 inches below yep. surface. You'd set your pellet six to 12 inches below your float, but it doesn't that fly. doesn't work, does it? No, obviously with a pole it's different because you're right over the top of it and you can immediately slap it over again and again and again. Yeah. With a waggler, that time frame of actually to get a bite is it's a little bit, it's harder, isn't it? Because you can only have one cast. So we're just trying to hang that pellet through them like that. And, and that slack line that you're creating yeah. with the three foot of distance between your float and your pellet creates a, a, a delay as the, as the pellet sinks. Yeah, and, and a bit, of, just enough for them to grab it. Just enough for them to grab it. And, oh, he's going. Great fishing here at Medellin's. Now, one thing I'm gonna do is keep that momentum of bait going in. So we're putting about, I don't know, six to eight pellets in, something like that. Yeah, so you've just took time out to feed to maintain yeah. the shoal. And sometimes a little break in feeding actually brings the fish up, so it's not always, you know what I mean? Sometimes the, your feeding actually can pull the fish down, so, but we'll talk about a bit more in depth about that. This is a beauty, isn't it? So you notice the wind just dropped and we got a bite straight away? Yeah. Because the presentation was obviously just a fraction better than the previous two casts. That's a cracker. Great fish. Lovely fish. Great fish near at Medellin's. And obviously with that wind, talking about the wind, that's why we've got the bomb rod set up as well, because if the wind gets up too much, obviously you uh, chuck a bomb on and, and catch some great fish on that. Yeah, because it's not, um, and it's probably at this point it's worth mentioning, that pellet waggler is a very effective method. Mm -hmm. um, but would you be right in saying or right in sort of mentioning that it's probably not a method that you're going to fish for five hours on a commercial fishery. No. It's just part of an armory. Part of an armory, yeah. yeah. And the bomb is just as important as the waggler. Don't get me wrong, the waggler's great to fish. It's enjoyable, it's effective, but we're always thinking about the bomb. And the bomb, you can chuck on it in the second half of your session and have a wonderful finish, you know? Because there's pellets, the pellets on the bottom. Working its way down fish, to the yeah. bottom, yeah. Look at that, the wind's dropped and the pellets have gone that way. Yeah, because when the fish want to be on top, They'll snatch at a few. Yeah, you'll see them. And they'll pick an odd and off the ones that you're feeding. But if they really want to be shallow, they won't follow them down, will no. they? So they'll, they'll not go to the bottom. Hopefully, we'll start being able to see a pattern now. So that one came on the first splash. But you see, I dr purposely dropped my next pellet, a bit shorter. Yeah. And then I'll crank the float back into it. Now the wind's picking up again, so I'm actually thinking I might need a heavier float on. Okay. And so by pulling that pellet, uh, that waggler in. It, about you get a second cast. Yeah. It yeah. just brings my hook bait back up into the killing zone. Yeah. And I suppose that's another thing about having it set at the three foot depth. It will actually... Oh, see that one. <laughs> and it's that, that one, I'd have, I think it was more interested in your float Flight, than it were yeah. your pellet. Um, because it's a long drop, it'll actually lift it up. Whereas if it were a short drop, you get the angle, without getting too complex, it, you In don't get right. that sort of slow yeah. fall again, but you're getting two casts out of, two out bites of one of cherry cast. almost. So the wind's actually picked up, it's making things quite tricky. But these are real conditions. We've not yeah, picked no, the flat calm day to do this. If you're, you know, coming here for the day to pleasure fishing, you've decided that you want to fish a pellet waggler. Pellet waggler. This is what you're up against. You know, and you might not get the spot where the wind's off your back, and but it's completely changed around the wind, hasn't it? It has, yeah. It's kind of off our shoulder now, isn't it? So like we'll, we'll see how you sort of tackle Boss with them it. conditions because you've already mentioned putting a bigger float, float on. Yeah. This is why I think it's so important to have that op option to put a bigger float on. Yeah. Like a rig that allows you, with a swivel on it, a, a rig on, you know that has a swivel on it to allow you to put a bigger float on because if I was just set up with a four gram float, it'd be great when it's flat calm. But on a day like this, on a big lake, no good at all. No. You need to try and keep that straight line between your rod tip and the float at all times. See, as soon as we chucked in, there's a bow formed. Yeah. So I'm thinking, right, I'm going to put the six grammar on next chuck, give myself a bit longer, and I may even sink the line as well. Which is not the preferred way of doing it, but at the end of the day, we've got to get conquer these conditions, don't we? Without a doubt. So of course, obviously I've noticed it, but when you're casting, you're feathering. Yep. You're feathering your, your line and your float 
by basically just touching your fingers onto the spool mm -hmm. and slowing it down so that you get that perfect lay, which I can see that. You're getting separation in between your floor yeah, it's mass it's and your pellet. Important. That's a big thing, isn't it? I can see that yeah. straight away. Obviously, in this day and age, we, we that art's lost a little bit because we're all chucking to a clip a lot of the time. Yeah. But you can't do that here because soon, every time you hook one, they run off. Because you would naturally say, if you could, fish yeah, to a clip, fish to a clip but... that would make life easier for the angler because he wouldn't have to think about feathering it and he would always get that uh, stop against his float and therefore a tight line. And so what I would get into was the fact that you're feathering it and when it's windy, <clears throat> it's not stopping you catching though. No, just put that bigger float on though, Mick. Well, think... that was quick. I didn't even see you do it. Yeah, I put Fair the, play. I just put the sixth grammar on and it... It just tightens everything just up. tightens everything yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. And there are days when the fish don't want any noise on the surface, you know, and those little light floats are great for that. But on a big venue like this, I don't think they mind the big floats sometimes. And I think we're all getting a little bit, like the elite anglers are all getting a bit obsessed with tiny floats all yep. the time. When I think you've still got to be able to boss the conditions. Well, ultimately... Presentation's everything, isn't it? Everything. Tackle's always got to match the conditions. Like on the river, we'd love to all use a two number four stick float. The yeah. reality is, three or five gram bolo's always the best float. Isn't yeah, it? because you can control your line. Yeah. So I'll just put that six grammar on and caught one straight away. Yeah. And if it gets windy, I'll put an eight grammar on. No problems. Which that. is why you've got a box full of floats. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And a rig that allows me to change them. Very important. That was the second one we've caught on the splash rather than the twitch, so that's a good sign. <laughs> and, and you pointing that out just sort of says to me that there'll be times when you catch them all on the twitch, yep. and sometimes you catch them all on the splash. Yep. Sometimes the and twitch. And varying points everything. in between. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned the word pattern, yeah, and that's what you'll get. And It's generally a pattern. Yeah. And I tell you what happens a lot with pellet wagon fishing as well, you get little runs of fish. I'm convinced they just swim around in little shoals and a few get in front of you, like there's a few here now that we haven't fed for a while and look, they're out there. Yeah, they are, aren't they? Which is lovely. Look at the bending that rod, mate. What's, how can you not enjoy this style of fishing? Well, it's, um, it's a lovely way to fish. It's just definitely testing your arm. <laughs> not even a big fish. No, but a fit, healthy like a fit, fish. healthy common, yeah. Yeah. So let's. I want to talk about that twitch because you notice I'm not even thinking about changing the depth. Well, that was going to be one of my next questions. Um, I sometimes consider myself a lazy angler, but I think it's when you're confident that you know that your rig's doing the right thing, mm -hmm. you then just go through the motions, knowing that your pattern will come. You've already mentioned a few fish will come at a time. Yep. You might get little runs of fish. And if you're changing your depth all the time, you're probably going to mean you're going to sometimes skip through the runs. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. So, get some pellets back in. And that float is just bossing the conditions completely. Oh. See, my line is dead straight to my float. Yeah. Allows me, gives me that few seconds to pick the catty up, feed just to touch short, and then reel back into the bait. And there's a fish there, so. Yeah, so you're maximising the amount of fishing time out of your cast. Whereas if your floats, it's too light, it's straight away it starts it's drifting, drifting yeah. the floats moving, the fish aren't stupid. They're not going to stab at a, a, a pellet that's moving sideways when all the ones that you're firing in for free are going down vertically. Buying yourself seconds. which in a method that ultimately get 80% of your bites in them few seconds is everything, isn't it? Yeah. Well, look how often we're in and out. It's um, it's definitely a work rate. It's a work rate and it's so important. I mean, right, one little trick I do, Mick, even though we're feeding eight mils, I often put a six mil on the hook. Go on then, explain that one to me. I think when you... When you've got fish razzing around like we've got today, that's a great word, isn't it? Razzing around. It's a Yorkshire term. There's fish razzing around, and sometimes you can miss a few bites on an 8 mil. Um, 
And I think sometimes it just, the six mil is just easy for him to take in and it sinks a touch slower. And I think sometimes an eight, uh, six mil is really good and I've won quite a few matches, pellet waggler for shin, still feeding eights, but then having a six on the hook. And it, you think, oh, it's not a standout bait, but I think the fact that it's, if it just sinks a little bit slower and it's a bit easier for him to take in, sometimes works. Yeah, when they're having a stab at it, yeah. as it were. Because ultimately, because your bites are so quick and this, to me, it's almost like the snatcher at this. Yeah. Uh, bait because there's bait going past. They're on top. They're trying to grab it. So do you think the six mil when they're having a quick there you go suck at it? On the yeah, six. unbelievable. It just goes in a bit easier in the swallow. It's so. a bit I easier. Think it's just a bit easier for them to take in and they miss it less. I think sometimes when you've got an eight on, you hook them like around the chops. Yeah. And I think and it, they might just miss it. It might even be a breeze this minute. <laughs> so some people might say, well, why not feed six mils? Yeah. If, if six mils the right bit. Yeah, no, and, and if you could get six mils out there with consistency and accuracy, yeah. a six mil would be a great bait to feed. Yeah, um, and I think there's the answer because... But we've got to imagine we're trying to fish at distance. This yeah. place, it's, it's not even a windy day today and we've got a wind on. Yeah. Imagine this with a good blow on it. Yeah. But yeah, that six mil, I don't know, I don't know what it is. It just works and it's the same when I fished um, pole shallow with six mils, I often put four mil on the hook, especially when there's some F1s around. You definitely miss less bites. Mm. One of those little quirks of the job. Bit of a wallow at this one, Mick. It's great fishing here at Medlin, isn't it? Yeah, it's fantastic. Ah, yes. The average is ridiculous. Yeah, you can soon uh, amass a weight if you're fishing a match. Calm down. Yeah, I don't think you were quite ready for that, next <laughs> Joe. <laughs> no. yeah, you can soon amass a weight if you were fishing a match, but if you were pleasure fishing, you're going to have a right day's fishing, aren't you? Oh. Yeah. So, obviously we've had an 8mm on, we've had a 6mm on. Yep. What other updates might you consider? Because I've heard... You know, people have all these kind of weird and wonderful ideas, yep. and and I've learned from these videos because you start to look at yourself deeply, and and obviously you're very similar. I think what we do is we go right. That's what I'm fishing. That's how I'm fishing it, and that's the right bait, mm -hmm. and we stick with it and yep. we make it work. Yeah. But I know that a lot of people are like, well, yeah, I tried a, a, a red pellet and I tried it yellow pellet and I put a bandam on or I put a wafter on or a, and I, I maggots on and but yet yeah, we're feeding pellets we've got pellet on the up yeah we change the size of it is there another bait that you'd consider putting on there um, yeah there is actually and you mentioned red pellets and I've got a lot of faith in red pellets actually um, don't ask me why I think that maybe the silhouette stands out a little bit maybe we'll put one on next chub um, yeah I've caught loads of fish on red pellets over the years ah. oh. Now that's interesting. <laughs> Another one on the Twitch. Yeah, the red pellet thing. I, I, especially on the bomb later in the day. Two red pellets is deadly. You think they can pick them out? Yeah, they can just pick them out sometimes, yeah. Um, but as far as other baits, obviously, we keep talking about the bait falling past them. So it stands to reason, why don't you put a slow sinking like wafter on or something? Yeah. And I have caught fish on wafters on pellet waggler, especially when mugging. But it's not a pellet. And, and I think the fish know the difference, which is, it sounds ridiculous, but the amount of times I thought, oh, a wafter, look, that's in the mouth, that. Yeah. The amount of times you think, it's a, it's a wafter day, and it, a good old eight mil coppins. Is the one. Is the one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I don't, don't know what that is. So you just mentioned that that's in the mouth. That's because the float never moved. You've just turned just, it like that. Yeah. You've picked up and, and it were there because it's gobbed the bait. Gobbed the bait. And as long as I'm, you know, not foul looking them. Yeah, yeah. And then it, it doesn't bother me, you know. So this is another reason why work rate's important. So if you just sit there and sit there and sit there and wait for the float to go under or your rod to get pulled in, mm -hmm. the chances are you're not going to be as effective as what you are if you're moving it, picking it up, recasting. Because there might be the fact that the fish has got it in its mouth, like that one obviously had. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to put an oat length on, Joe. Yep. Um, and I saw the one that you put on the rig to start with. Mm -hmm. 
And it's long. Very long. That's um, two foot in it at least. At least, yeah, probably a bit longer. Um, I like to tie them long and then I can shorten them or go deep because there's, like this venue, for example, if I was down there where it's very deep, I might have to fish five foot deep and I quite like having a long hook length. I think it's strong, a long hook length. It's stretchy. I think it's good. So, But obviously today, that's too long for what we're going to do. So I'm just going to take about 10 inches off it. Okay. And what's good about that is I can also use that hook length for pole fishing. I can use it for whatever. I can shorten it right down. So... I think that's a great idea. And, and, and I know it's something you do, isn't it? No, it, it is, because, of course, you have to... I think I mentioned in a previous video, if you've got to tie three-inch short lens, four-inch short lens, 10-inch short lens, an 18-inch short lens, mm. for instance, if you want to fish bomb and pellet and you want to go to an 18-inch, well, why not just tie 18-inch short lens yeah. um, and then chop them down to two? Mm. Because, of course, you're not buying a two-foot hook length off the peg. Um, but I think... And I've seen this with you before. You, when we fish shallow on a pole, you don't particularly like a really short length either, because you like to have the whole of the, the yeah, like a 12-inch hook length. For yeah, I'm yeah. So if you're fishing a foot, you don't mind a, a, a foot an 11. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. you will have your float down to the the loops, won't you? And I think that gives you a little bit of confidence that you've not got your main line, the thicker line, yeah, or, and, or more importantly, the loops. Yeah, loops interfering with everything. Yeah, because it's not like. We're talking about fishing with the fine up length. No, so 20 that is, strong. Yeah. Right, so for case of uh, experimentation, let's put a red pellet on. Why not? Fresh hook. Greatest hook in the world at the moment. I love these hooks. What have you got on there? That is a 14 Kamasan Animal Feeder, which is a wonderful hook. It's a small 14. It's, not, it's more like a 16 in, in other people's hooks. Well, the ducks like the pellets here, but I tell you what, I can see fish. Oh, the fish are there. Around that duck, so it's it don't bother fish, does it? I think people get obsessed with no, I ducks like ducks. I like them in my swim. I think the fish know where the food is. If the ducks carrying on, the fish know. See, the wind just picked up. Yeah. So we've got. A, might be. Sometimes you can obviously catch leaving the float hanging. But not in a wind like this. Now, I don't know if you noticed, Nick. We'll just put that red on. Got one straight away. Straight away. I've just the cast. I think the casting technique is something we should touch on. Because I'm a lobber. Naturally, I'm quite a, a lobber of a caster. Like when like I'm feeder slow. fishing, I like a nice. Yeah. Feeders in the air for ages. Guide it into the swim. Goes in with a plot. But with pellet waggler. That's no good at all because you're fighting the bow from the minute you float it's the water. The bow in your line. The bow in your line. Yeah. It needs to be a punch cast. It needs to be a low, flat cast that gets you, you gives you that the longest time to have that straight, straight main line. So your floats in the air for less a shorter period trying of time. To, yeah, trying to like therefore you've not got in there. you've not got the wind yeah, working yeah. against you. Because look at the wind well, now. That's really that's a massive tip that is. Yeah, and it's it's a totally different. Like I say, I'm. Naturally, I'm a, lob, a lobber of a caster, just how I am. Yeah. But for this, that's no good. And the fact that you're consciously changing how you cast, I think is a brilliant lesson for people watching that you've purposely changed how you cast to suit to combat the conditions. The method that yeah. you're doing and the conditions that you're in. Yeah. Because if it was flat calm, you could get away with a bit of a looper. But because we've got this wind that we're battling, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, and it were tight, thought when you right picked way. up and you, you've hooked it. Because I'm, you know, you can miss... <laughs> a terrible bit of netting, mate. You can miss bites on it. If you've got too much line, it's yeah. moving, the presentation's not quite right, they're snatching at it because it's moving, they're not quite got it, whereas if you've got, if they've got a little bit... Oh, I can see that red just took out of the corner just, of its mouth. Just right in its shops, look. Big old mouths on them, aren't they? Aren't they just? Coming. And the average year it meant they're just ridiculous, aren't they? The fishing's just great. And it is noticeable, we were before we started filming, it was flat calm and it was it was quite tricky, wasn't it? But since this wind's got on, the fishing definitely improved. They've got more confident. Yeah, I think that little bit of ripple yeah. just just knocked the edge off them and they they're having a bit more of a chill. Because I've seen one or two moving in the pellets, whereas when we were feeding before we got started uh, fishing. Mm. They were kind of swimming around under the surface and being a bit coy and 
almost like a mugging day, whereas all of a sudden now they're feeding. No, they're feeding that. It's a feeding yeah. day. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, I use a bander. Now, this isn't a plug for banders. No, no I have noticed that. Um, because I'm not, I've not seen you I don't one use, when we... I don't use a bander normally. No. But when you're casting in out all the time, I like to have the smallest band that I can have on. Because sometimes you chuck out and your pellet will come off. Whereas with this, I need my pellet to be on. So I like a tiny band and the only way to get an eight mil or a big six in there. I see. Is with a, you can do it obviously with your fingernails, but it is a bit of a challenge. I always like to yeah. bring the bander out. Because you've got a smaller band on to keep just, it tight. To, yeah, it just makes so me you're more, not losing your pellet. more efficient. So the wind just dropped nice now. Well, yeah, there's a nice gen bit, bit gentle breeze, yeah. yeah. Need plenty of pellets. Look at that one there, look. He's gonna have it, isn't he? You notice I, I, I use the rod rest all the time. I've got it just at the right height, the rod tip's just out of the water. It's yeah, like because an you, extra pair of hands. You're leaving one hand free so you can feed and then you can strike. And if you're trying to feed and hold your rod, and obviously you've eliminated quite a bit of that by feeding before you before, cast, which yeah. is what you're doing now. But if you do want to feed <coughs> before you twitch, your rod's in rest and you've got a spare hand. Yeah, and, and sometimes when they're really having it, you don't have to strike at all, you'll just see the rod go around, yeah. you know? Which is really exciting when that starts that, happening. It now, just to show you, don't it? Because we've had one where the float didn't go under, but then that one looked like it were on, and that's just how it is. Yeah. Which is why you've got to keep your work rate up. Yeah. I mean, I always say this, that if you caught one every chuck, you'd empty the lake. If you were fishing a match, you know, you'd, you'd break the world record. Yeah, you can't just keep catching eight pound carp. And it's not like that. I mean, obviously the catch rate's brilliant, but fish per cast at this is probably um, quite a low rate, but the effective day's fishing results in a massive weight. Mm -hmm. I don't even notice what I'm trying to do here. I'm just having a break from feeding for a little bit. Yeah. I'm just seeing if we can get one on without feeding for a little bit. Sometimes it can bring them really high and you can have a really... Good just changing it up a bit. Just changing it up sometimes. Because all of a sudden they're like, where's all the pellets gone? And the only thing going in is your float. And it probably works when the fishing's harder than it is, to be fair, because we're catching loads of fish. If you're trying to pinch a fish when they're being a little bit later in the match, like second half of the match when they get a bit a bit cute, sometimes yeah. doing this can make all the difference. I've just seen two fish move in that yep. pouch of pellets. Oh, they'll be ready for the bait now. Which is, yeah. is interesting, because you've just mixed that up, you didn't feed, it didn't work, you've fed, you've gone in and you've got one. Yeah, because they were ready for the pellets then. Yeah. They were like, where are they gone? No, I, saw, I saw two fish come up. Yeah, where are they gone? And it's all about these little intricacies of it. It's a simple method, but there's loads you can do. And that's why the, the real good lads at this are so good, because they're thinking about it all the time. It's so very easy to get stuck in a little rut of doing the same thing over yeah. and over again. Yeah, feed, cast, feed, cast, but changing it up and watching what they're doing. Or changing it up to see if you get an effect, mm -hmm. and then remembering what that effect is. And it, you can't do the same thing all day. Stop, start, stop. But you'll start to get a feel for what works and what doesn't work. Look at them out there, mate. Because at the size of these fish, you're not going to have to catch that many <laughs> to, to amass a, a silly weight, wouldn't it? A big weight. So little changes that result in a fish are, are massive rewards, aren't they? Yeah. And you see how that I've got out, like 020 hook length on, but I've been. If I had some, I'd happily use 022. Um, yeah, because they're taking it on the side. You, and you, that sounds so slack, doesn't it? If I had some, but it's true, I ain't got any. <laughs> brilliant. Um, you're, um, it's obviously, you fight, you know, you're playing them playing big quite fish. firm, yeah, so you're not being shy with them. You're bossing them. And I think the, the bait is in the killing zone for such a little amount of time, they're not getting a chance to inspect it. So why not have, you know, a bit of extra strength? It's funny because you've got quite a thick line on, but a relatively small looking proportion. Because uh, yeah. I think most people naturally bigger up, bigger line, yep. or bigger line, bigger up. Whereas your combination, 
slightly different to that because all 20 is strong well it's what most up length lines sort of max out at but you've got all 20 and then you've got a what hook have you got on there a 14 but it's more like a 16 yeah it's not a big hook that it's is not it not a big hook at all but it's a small and it's a very strong pattern that's razor sharp and i think that's small and strong is good and you think a small hook for this kind of fishing do, do, is that the same for uh, when I you're fishing bomb and pellet or <laughs> method feeding? No, we'll, we'll go on to, we'll catch one more and then we'll have a look at the bomb because that is just as important as the waggle. At the minute, you wouldn't come off this because no. they're up for it. The wind's brought them up. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you have to be careful of the wildlife. <laughs> an odd feather. An odd feather there, look. But, like I said, sometimes the bomb is the better better option. But not as enjoyable as this. I don't care what anyone no, says. No. Because it's active oh. you, and that you're striking, you you're watching your float and that's really important. So you for, for a pellet waggler, mm -hmm. you, you like it that small I small like it. And I think it, it probably comes from my background as yours, river fishing. Yeah. Like when I used to chub fish on a waggler, I'd use a small but strong hook. Yep. And I just think I, I struggle to get away from it. I don't doubt for a minute that if you put a 12 or you get loads of bites. It's just confidence in my head. I like a small strong hook. And I, and I use a small strong hook a lot. That were definitely on the twitch. That were definitely on the twitch. You know, I use that pattern of hook all the time. Because I'll, the strong. And I'll use yeah. the 16 pole fishing a lot, which is a tiny hook. Um, yeah fills me with confidence and I use that yeah. this same size for method fishing as well because it's, mm. it's not it's more about the strength and the hook hold as opposed to the size of the hook I because big don't always mean strong does it I think a small forged pattern like this is is a very very strong hook maybe yeah. even stronger than a 12 in this pattern because it's so tight the bend's so tight yeah I think it's just a yeah there's no leverage from no, the no, point no. and uh, I think sometimes we get a bit carried away with big hooks it's not always the answer yeah, I mean... There's a time and a place, of course it is. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel that they need to match their hook to the fish. And I think it's more often not, it's hook to the bait. Yep. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you need to put 10 maggots on, you're not putting that on a 16. No. Um, but with a pellet it's that's air rigged, yep. then you've got all the hook exposed and there's enough hook in that size of hook to um to land any fish in a in a lake like this um and as you said sometimes actually the smaller sizes in a pattern can be just as strong i was going to go on the bomb mic next yeah. but, but i think what we should look at is bigger floats again because all of a sudden we've got the wind's getting up and i want to just show the effectiveness of big floats brilliant i think it's so important, and while the fishing's good, we can show the viewers how. Yeah, because that is, I think, a question that probably a lot of people want to know is, what size waggler do I need? Look at that. He's a beautiful fish. Not having pull a float under me. He had it, it in his mouth, didn't he? Yeah. Cute. Cute fish. That is a big immaculate. <laughs> that is a big fish. That's the biggest one of the session so far. Look at that. They call him the immaculate common, Mick. I can see that. Look at him. Look at that thing. Oh. <laughs> He's double figures, isn't he? Oh, and, and more. Look at that, the pellet is right down there, look. I'm coming for a look. Tiny up. Massive. Oh. Tiny up. Yeah. Great or cold. Yeah. Massive mouth. That is a fish, isn't it? That's Don't a cracker, isn't him. it? He's a, he's a darling. He ain't missed any pies, does he? No, no. And he can hold the pellet in his mouth without pulling floats under as well. It's yeah, cute. Cute. So let's uh, let's stick a bigger float on. Yeah. And uh, we'll show that you know it's not all about these tiny floats. Okay, Mick. So we're going to change float. Yep. Um, everyone has seen these in the tackle shop. So these are base weighted balsa dowel wagglers, yep. heavy duty wagglers, which a lot of people will pick them up and be like, Ugh. feel a bit off funny about them. Yeah, because they're quite a big old thing. Industrial. Yeah. Big aggressive thing. float yeah 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 but there's a time and a place where that is the ultimate float and i'm not saying it's today because the fishing's good and they're having everything shallow but when you've got a hanger float you've got a tricky wind 
you've got not very long, you know, before you've got that bow forming, or you need to chuck it out, bring it back a little bit, get some, you know, you need to boss the conditions. These bolster types, these dowel types, are deadly. Big venues, Boddington, here, if I was down there in the wind, that'd be just They just fish quite, differently. Which, I mean, you'll see in a minute. Wait, to see how well these cast. That's interesting, isn't it? And, because um, fundamentally, they all look the same. They all look the same, but these, for some reason, they dive deeper, they make a bit more noise, they're not as nice to use, because obviously sometimes we want the float to hit the water and sit straight away. These don't do that, but some days you have to fish this float. Got you. So we'll show you. There's and I think when we've done float fishing videos before, we've talked about different floats and they all do a different thing. Yep. Um, even though the Looks slim, the long. Look at that, it's like a dart. <laughs> yeah. It goes under a bit lower. The six gram is a bit, not as obvious to show you. In fact, I'll pop the eight gram on. Next chuck to show you. But like I say, when you're hanging a bait, which can work, can work really well. So you're using the float for a different reason, different is reason. basically what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Eight gram bolts are on, which I've got to be honest, is probably too heavy for this. I just wanted to show you that the difference that it can make is in keeping your line tight, keeping you in bossing the conditions when conditions are tough. Yeah, because it doesn't particularly look that much different, but it obviously is. it carries yeah. a lot more weight. Yeah. Eight gram. The float itself has got a weight to it, so it's dense. It's like a fully, what I call a fully loaded, um, like a normal waggler. waggler. All the weight's already in. There's no nothing underneath it, no separate weights. Therefore, it probably casts more direct. Just look at it, it just sits there. Yeah. Just sits there. A bit more stability. Yeah, it's like a man float. And what would be the biggest waggler that you'd even carry? Uh, I've got them up to 10 grams. Um, I don't do a lot of fishing on... Oh, there's one up. I don't do a lot of fishing on those big venues, but I've got some old John Bonnie Wagglers, which is the... Well, even I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. he used to sell them at, at, at Boddington, like big old... Like, what these were based on, basically. Yeah. Um, big old do uh, dowel things, and they're massive. <laughs> but they were, like, at Boddington, they were the right flow. Because of the conditions? Because of the conditions. You... That's another one that's, like, wallowing in luck. For now. Yeah, he's woke up. Um, and I think that that just shows you that difference. Like, if you've got. And I could tell about how it, how it casts. Yeah. But the downside is it does make more noise, it does dive deeper. So it's a horse's, horse's job, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it's important to have one in your armoury. Yep. You've just clipped it on. And if, if you're on a day where, like you said, you've probably got to wait four or five seconds for a bite as opposed to it hits the surface and it goes, and like, you I'll change you, the float accordingly. I'll tell you what I think is a great comparison to make when it comes to feeder, like feeder choice, for example. Like, we, we, we all put a window feeder on and it casts amazing, doesn't it? Yep. It makes casting effortless, yep. but it's not always the right tool for the job. No. That's a bit like that. That's a bit like your window feeder. It makes casting effortless. It makes the whole job easy. So it's very easy to just think, well, I'll put that one on. It makes my life easier. I'll just keep going with this. But sometimes, we'll, in fact, we'll clip another pellet type, uh, waggler type on now, uh, uh, more of a foam type, and we'll show the difference. Because, of course, you... It's very easy to get stuck in a rut, isn't it? There's a few things that are going to dictate uh, these sort of elements to your fishing. Mm -hmm. One is how far you want to fish. Yep. Uh, one is the conditions. Yep. And then, also, you're limited by how far you can feed because you have to feed to catch on a pellet. Unless you're what they call mugging fish and there's a big pile of fish in front of you chucking out and without feeding, mm -hmm. ultimately you're gathering a few fish that are snatching at the bait. So no point in trying to having a float that's fishing further than you can cast your uh, fire your pellets. So, so I've just put the foam one on now. It, it all you see how it wobbles? I can, I can it's totally see different. That. Landed a lot softer. Lot landed softer. This is these are the floats you want to be on, really. For, you know, when they're feeding shallow like they are now. Yeah, when they snatch it right off the top. But look, I've got a big bow formed. Yeah, because it's not kept it's it not straight. It's not kept it straight. Brilliant. And it's, it's all different. And that's a big float, that's a five gram still. So it's yes. The biggest foam float that I carry. Uh, so that's interesting. That You only take them up to five, five gram because yeah. of the way that you need to do it. The conditions mean that 
it, it, it would negate it if you had a bigger one. Mm -hmm. You might as well just then put a Balsa fully loaded yeah. or oh, one probably chuck the bomb out. I'll chuck the bomb out, yeah. I mean, look at that, it's just yeah, it's horrible not, now. It's horrible not fishing. That. I'm going to change float again because I'm not happy with that. But, ev but everyone's obsessed with foam floats. Yeah, because... But that is clearly not the right float for this. For me, and what I love about doing these sessions is that I'm going to go back I to the point we started on, the six gram crystal. I don't do this. So I'm like, well, which float are you using? Which is best? I'd say to you, which is best float? What do I need? Mm. And because we know each other and we both understand the technicalities of fishing. So that's immediately better. That's somewhere in the middle, I'd better. say. I'd yeah, say that's... Yeah. Look at that. That's it's, some, obviously, it's obviously worked. That's somewhere in between the, the, the dowel type and the foam type, that, I'd say, that crystal. Somewhere in between. A bit Just noisier than the foam. But, fishes differently. But not quite as aggressive as the, the dowel one. Yeah, so, you you know, I'd say to you, which is the best float? And you go, well, they're good, <laughs> this is good, that's good, that's yeah. good. Um, and we aren't saying to people, you've got to go out and buy every single float on rack, or you need a foam, you need a crystal, oh, you need a, a balsa. Actually, if you're going to um, guarantee to success, <laughs> or not take the point that you've got to accept that you might not have exactly the right setup on on the day that you choose to go fishing, mm -hmm. it reinforces why we have different Set amounts up. of kit. And by talking to them today, it'll just help us to understand it a little bit. And straight away, I'm like, yeah, that's why I've got a big box full. But I didn't really know why I've got different ones, but yep. it's clearly pointed out that there's even efficient margin yeah. here. Um, there's a time and a place for them all. And that's not necessarily different venues, um, different swims. That could actually be same swim. Different times of day. Depending on the conditions. And like before, when it was flat calm, you would want a, a nice foam float on ideally, because like if I was up there, the next peg up's flat calm today, you can see them in the scum and all that. Yeah. A foam float would be lovely there. Absolutely fantastic. Because what do we say there's a rule of thumb? The lighter the better. The lighter the better, within which reason. Is, which is, a little bit of a fishing rule of thumb. You want the most um, delicate's not the word, is it? Refined kit possible that you can fish with wherever wherever you're fishing and whatever yeah. you're doing. But I just think there's there's a big misconception at the moment that light is always best, and it's not always the case. You've got to match it to the conditions. Yeah, because you won't catch anything. You'll have a beautiful little float. Oh, I've a, like if I put the three water grammar on here, yeah. which will go in like a little fairy in the water. Yeah. And I'm sure that's great, it doesn't spook the fish. Because there's pellet wagglers knocking them out at two gram, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, and I use them, Mick, for like the right situation. Yeah. Close in, mugging work, that kind of thing. But for four to six gram is, I'd say, your uh, bulkier fishing will be done with them sizes. That's brilliant. It's a great bit of advice. Should we have a go on the bomb? Why not? So, after catching the load on uh, on the surface, obviously we're feeding pellets and I've noticed, I'm sure you have, there's a few bubbles coming off the bottom, so yep. uh, do we think there's a few fish down there? I think there's a, more than a chance of a few fish. Now, the small print is we were catching really regular on a waggler, yeah, you, but you wouldn't have come off it no. in a match no. situation. But, likewise in a match situation, once you've been feeding that wag for two or three hours, the bomb can be unbelievably good and it can give you that almost like a margin effect, like you can have a really strong finish, it's effective, it's efficient, you're chucking it in, you're getting a proper pull. It can it can pay to slow your swim down with a bomb sometimes and That's just pick them off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've had that quite a few times where I felt like I'm thrashing the water, um, I'm going 20, 30 minutes without a carp on the waggler and you chuck the bomb in and you'll catch eight and eight chucks, like the swim just needed a chance just to to calm down. Brilliant. So we're not messing about, we've got a 15 gram bomb on and we've got a great big up bait on. Well, two... Here's a bit I've never used. Two red pellets. Okay. Size 10 hook. We've got to try and stand out. There's a million bubbles coming up. It's just, it's the bait to use. So, what I like to do, put the rod in between my legs and I'm just gonna up the bait a bit to try and force one down to the bottom. So what you're saying is by feeding more pellets yep. at one time, there's more chance of fuel getting through. Yeah. Let's see. 
if we catch one, mate. So, just to get into your mind a bit, what's made you put two pellets on when clearly they're feeding on one pellet? Is it a, a confidence thing, a sight thing? What is there a reason behind thing. it? Is Some, it just sometimes you? when you've got all that, like, like if you look now, it's gone calm. It's a perfect example for it actually. Um, there's so much bait on the bottom. There's a lot of noise on the bottom. All that bubbles coming up, and you know yourself. Sometimes if you're fishing pole, you're fishing a six mil pellet in amongst a load of bait on the bottom, and you don't get a bite when it's fizzing like that. Sometimes you just got to have a big visual bait, and it's the kind of day when paste works. When that's happening, paste is really good. Yeah. And we're trying to not create paste fishing, but we're trying to make a big visual object for them to home in on, and it can work absolutely brilliant. I'll often start just putting an eight mil on, but if I can fish a big bait like a double pellet, I'm more confident. Especially Ivy's red one as well. Yeah. I mean, you've had three indications already on that too. Yeah. One were clearly a liner, but the last two have like been little pecks, as I call it. Probably a fish trying to pick it up. And but they've succeeded on this I've one. I've had matches so. here, for example, when I've not had a single bite on a waggler, but. But you've been but I've feeding it that 150 way. 150 pound, 180 pound on a bomb Incredible. underneath them because there's pegs up there that are really shallow and there's probably just not enough water for them to come up, if that makes sense. So, yeah. the bomb is honestly, it's, it's almost as big a part of the pellet waggler as the pellet waggler itself. Yeah. Because it's a swim you've created. It's a swim, yeah. Rather than fishing a method. And, some, and sometimes it's leading to a big crescendo and sometimes your, your big finale is actually on the bomb because it's so efficient. Like we chuck that out, we've sat on our hands, it's gone around with caught a out. Yeah, ideally if you want to have a cup of tea as well. Perfect. Want to have a cup of tea. But it's a different it's a different aspect to the same swim. Yep. We're covering the water column, aren't we? Yeah. It's funny, I noticed you, you chucked it right on this front edge of where all that bait's been landed. But obviously when we're fishing up top, Oh, with, with Waggler, more often than not, you're fishing off back of your bait, whereas this is this is where all your pellets are landing, and you've chucked it right where... Right in the middle. Yeah, right in the middle well, of all them bubbles. If um, if it was a little bit short, I'd love to come up with a lovely complicated reason. It was probably because it was a bad cast, if I'm being brutally <laughs> honest. Well, that's fair enough, I love but the honesty. I like to be in the middle of the... the yeah, you're not chucking this past, bait. are you? Yeah, no, no, I want to no. be in the... I mean, look at that, great big bruise, look at that. And <laughs> I love the bomb. Look at that, bottom lip, size 10 hook. Two red pellets. Two red pellets. Again, I um, actually tie two bands together. Um, so I tie my band on as normal and I, with a little grin and not, I actually tie the bottom band on. Brilliant. And I find that just presents the bait really nicely. But you do need a little, it's a bit delicate, so you do need to uh, get yourself a banding tool. I'm bothered about the banding. I promised it wouldn't be a sales pitch about banding tools, but I no. With that method, you definitely need it because you're not you're not then getting your fingers in between a pellet and a banding. <laughs> Brilliant. So we'll catch one more on this because it's not there's not much to see on this, but it is very important. It's really important. And you know, it's actually well, that's one thing that I'll mention. I have quite a long hook length. It'd be very tempted to just have a little tiny hook length, and I'm sure there's places where that works really well, but I've never found them. <laughs> No, and and it's funny because of course when you look at the fundamentals of commercial, let's call it ledgering, here's a word that's not used very often. So bomb fishing, method fishing, pellet feeder fishing. When yeah. you're fishing with a method or a pellet feeder or banjo or that type of feeder, ordinarily you've got a four inch hook length on. That'd be the average length up length mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then when you fish a bomb I'm right Very in saying that you know, five <laughs> yeah it's perfect example <laughs> um, most people would fish a what 12 to 18 inch up length on a bomb yeah I'd say so and that would confuse some people if you're a stranger to mm. this kind of fishing you're a newcomer I've, um... Um, so just to explain why you'd have a really short length with a Method feeder, banjo feeder, that type of thing, and then a longer rope length with a bomb. What's the difference? I think, um, I think there's a lot, lot to unpack there, really, actually, because with a bomb, I, I honestly believe the fish see it coming through the water. They hear the bomb, 
and then the, there's a pellet dragged down behind it. Mm -hmm. and I think sometimes, a bit like with feeder fishing, you'll experience this. All the theory suggests you should have a hook length on that long. We've seen it in the underwater footage. Yeah. The, the feeders, the hook length should be that long because that's where the fish are feeding. But the reality actually in a fishing situation sat on a seat box is different, isn't it? That you catch loads on a four foot hook length on a yep. feeder. Yeah. And I think the bomb's the same. And don't get me wrong, the theory is sound for a little tiny hook length. They pick it up, they can't eject it, all that. But the, my experience of actually fishing, <laughs> I think you catch more on a longer hook length as a general rule. And I'm, I'm convinced they see it come down and they might not take it straight away, but I'm sure they clock it and it's there. And I just think you catch more doing it. And Brilliant. I've been out with Andy Finley, who's one of my heroes, and he uses a four foot hook length for his bomb and pellet fishing. And he's a tiny little size 18 hook. And you'd think that there's no way you'd catch anything. And he catches loads on bomb and pellet. And he's convinced that they just sit and watch that pellet come down and then they'll snatch it. Mm. And um, there's a flip side to that. And I think when it's maybe like this and you're sitting patiently for a bite, maybe a short hook length is better because it's all set up on the bottom. But I think here today it would pay to cast the bomb a lot more regular because I think they've obviously driven if, coming if to the noise. Through, yeah. And I think that, yeah. that a, uh, a long hook length is better here with regular cast. Whereas I think if you're sitting on a long cast, for 15 minutes waiting for a bite, then maybe a short one that does the job for you, hooking the fish, mm. is better. Mm. And, that, and that's the thing that's going through my mind because hooking the fish. So when we fish a method, and I know there's all sorts of um, terminal tackle, like beads that kind of give some resistance when the fish picks up the, the up bit on the method. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I, I've always liked a free running bead where yep. it's just butter up against the end of the feeder but ultimately the idea is that it's self hooking so as soon as it picks up on a short hook length it, there's nowhere to go and obviously it bolts and it yep. hooks the fish with an 18 inch hook length or even a up to four foot in a Mr Finley style you're not actually getting that effect of the bolt but yet your rod will get dragged in on a bomb yeah. and you've got all that slack which just goes to show you that how much resistance is in that slack quite a lot I'd imagine well I I have this thing in my mind that when the fish has picked up the bait and it tries to spit it back out, that's when the hooking, mm -hmm. um, actual the, the physics of the hooking goes off. It, that's when the hook sticks in. That's when the fish panics. That's when it screams off because ultimately, why would it be screaming off on a bomb if it hasn't felt the resistance? But there's a resistance of some description in there yeah. or whether the, the hook's been... Um, whether you've hooked the fish as it's tried to eject the bait who knows but it's an interesting theory because clearly you know and i've done a little bit of bomb bomb and pellet fishing you get your rod dragged in yeah and it's um, it's a brilliant method it's a great it's a great way to fish see like they're getting there's loads of indications yeah when the there. and that's obviously we should be on the waggler <laughs> it's the truth yeah yeah um, yeah but it's a great experiment it's a great and, demo, demo because it is so important as part of your armory um, but yeah, uh, there's no rhyme or reason. We can all fish to the textbooks and the, what we see on these underwater films, but actual fishing, um, I mean, look, yeah, that's hooking it, itself, no problem, innit? Without, without a doubt. So it just... Did you notice what I did actually? But you'd never... out again? I did, I did see that, yeah. I, I'm, I yeah. think your, your first minute to a minute and a half is, that's the time when you're getting your bites. When they're coming to the noise of the pellets, I think they follow the bomb down. Because you've got the noise of the bomb, which is like you're feeding. Even seen on some shallow venues, people paint the bomb like a white or an I've orange. Heard, yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it's so something it's you think, well, that's a gimmick, but enough people do it and think it makes a difference. So they're following the bomb down and, yeah. Laughing, I think, was the one where that was a big, big thing. Yeah, I've, I've heard of that, but I've not seen it. So I was just thinking then, some might say, well, why don't you fish your 12 to 18 inch hook length on a method then? And of course, it's the one big difference with that is that they're coming to try and eat the bait that's on the method. They're eating the micros, different, that, they're feeding different. Yes. They're coming to the noise of these yeah, pellets, they're, aren't they? They're grubbing on that, whereas this is a single, or not a single bait, but because obviously you lose feeding, but. It's just scattering the bait on the bottom, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, and they're picking them odd bits of. And I think that's know, the difference as well. I think when you've got a scattering of pellets on the bottom, I think the fish are actually having to move between pellets, picking them up. So they're moving, whereas with a method, they're like hoovering on the spot, aren't they? Yeah, great. And I think they're yeah, feeding in a analogy. slow, yeah. slow situation, whereas I think when they're eating pellets, 
they're actually moving around and I think that makes them very catchable as well. I think that's a, that's a big thing. Hence why it's important to keep casting. It's enough for me waffling on. It's your turn, Mick. I've got my centre brew. I can't, I can't fault you. You've left me... Um, see what you've done there? You've put them down at bottom and I've not got to work them back yeah, up no, to the top. First thing I've noticed, you're not fishing as far out as me. No, I'm a Pull bit... Pull the catty back. <laughs> I'm, a bit, I'm a bit more gentle, aren't I? It's funny, I'm, I'm, I'm like that with quite a few things. I, I try not to... And your rod uh, rest needs to come up a bit. I try not to be um, fish to me extremes. Straight away, I'm not putting my waggler down far enough. Not being positive enough, I can tell that because I've got drift straight away. <laughs> but I think that's important though, isn't it? It's the difference, isn't it? The, the casting. Yeah, yeah. See, you're quite a, um, a progressive caster, a bit like me with a feed, like Gen a lobber, of, aren't you? More of a gentle yeah. lob, yeah, yeah. I've never liked never, no, pushing not, things to the limit. That's better. That's better. That's a lot better, isn't it? So that's off the back edge. That's off the back edge. Yeah. And of course, I've not fed before I've cast because I'm not into the There's rhythm. There's a million fish out there, so we're going to get some. Bottom. Even I could catch one, is that what you're trying to say? There's loads, like Twitch. Oh. There's fish everywhere, isn't there? Yeah. And because I've not done it right, I finished up with a ball, so when yeah. I did that, it didn't go in the right place. So let's get. Started. And this is a great example of what you made look so easy. Um, is that you Bring have to rod up, you have to get in re you rest up. You have to get into it, yeah, because I want my rod more in front, out yeah. of the water. Yeah, and swing it more towards like yeah, that's it, that's yeah. Make it comfy for you. It's not easy, I'm sat on a child seat box. Well I, <laughs> I, ne I nearly said uh, dwarf, but um <laughs> And I'm not very tall myself, but I, I think I sit a lot higher. Um, which is another a point, isn't it? You must, you must get yourself comfortable. Yeah. And what suits you might not suit me, clearly. Um, that, was, that was better, though. I think I got a line bite off a leg, leg bite. And you'd have, you'd have twitched by now, wouldn't you? Yeah. I have been watching. Come on. What are you going in on, Mick, an 8 mil? Yeah, I have, um, naturally, which yeah. is obviously that's interesting, isn't it? I didn't even considered. So I didn't listen to what you'd said. Um, and straight away, and that shows the old-fashioned waggler angler in me. I'm trying to cast them feet. Yeah, cast them feet. And, and that's not the way, because yeah. you need to set up the I'm peg. 20 yards closer in than I am. Yeah. Um, um, match your catty out, and then they all go the same place, then. Um, fish are what they call it, aren't they? They're coming up with me pellets are landing because why wouldn't they? I'm going to put one more in just to make sure I gather my fish. And they're there. Oh, they're there. So that's an interesting thing that I didn't spot with you, that you're, and I've cast it too far. Um, no, you haven't. That's the spot. That is the spot. Even the blind squirrel it's job. It's easy to get your float to land better when it's almost at the end of its trajectory. Yeah, because it's, it's hard. when you're chucking it well within its distance, it's hard. Yeah, because you've not got yeah, the right amount of get it uh, distance, speed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Chucking it a bit further makes it easier, and you're pulling your cat back the same distance, and it groups everything together a bit better. Yeah. And that is. And that's why I go through three or four catties a match. Because. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm maxing my gear out, but. It's a real test on your catapults, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that is one thing I didn't say in the in the piece is that you need a few catties with you. Because even the best catties, and we're using great catties here from Preston and Drennan, they still break, unfortunately. Yep. Because they're it's, not made for this. It's the nature of the beast, and a lot of people don't realise, but if they're using meat or oily pellets, oily pellets yeah. that accelerates the deterioration of elastic. It's a bit of a, this could be a bit of a lad, this bit. Plodding in, isn't he? Yeah, he's... Um, I thought I'd gaffed it then, but... No, I think you've got... Yeah, he's uh, not quite ready, is he? No. For eight pound plus fish, probably. Yeah, it's a test on your tackle. Um, it's aggressive fishing, isn't it? Without a doubt. And obviously catapults are fundamental to this method. I think... Um, i tell you what I've done there, Joe. I should have had him. <laughs> no, no, he never. Uh, there was no chance to get him then. There was no chance. No Big fish here, aren't they? Yeah, great. And that, that, if you do just want to come and get your string pulled, this is the place to come. I tell you, Medellin's is just fantastic fishing. 
because the, the average is so high, you can catch them on loads of different methods. I'm sure if we yeah, were pole fishing, fish. slapping here today, we'd catch a load, sharp pole edge. Brilliant. And now you can park behind your peg on this bank, it's even better. Yeah, that's incredible, the work they've done here, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, fair play to them. It's, it's a um, fish, this mate. It's a big, that could be a double, a that one. Look at him. He's yours. Oh, I'll tell you what, <laughs> I've done a bit of a shuffle. Um, yeah, the new ownership, um, Wayne Sharman's, took over this place here at Medellin's, and I know Wayne, a fantastic angler himself. Yeah, and a great match organiser. Without a doubt, he'll know exactly what anglers are looking for in a fishery. Just got the line wrapped underneath, um, and I, and I know that he'll take this place on. It's a great fishery, but I know he'll take it on from where it is. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. And we'll see a great. Um, I'm gonna have to get my discord on that, Joe. Next drawdown. Excellent. Um, yeah, he'll, he'll take it on from where it is, and That'd be fantastic. things can only get better, as they say. He's a massive fish. I'm not even going to attempt to. Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt to uh, pick that one no, up. No, he's too big to be lifting out, isn't he? He is. Further, Mick. Further. Further, Mick. So you're gonna, you're gonna have one more, aren't you? I can't resist it. Resist. Look, them ducks are right up for it. In fact, I'm going to say that you better get the uh, torches out. It could be a while dark. <laughs> Doing my chub fishing headlamp on by the time we're finished here. So. Now, it's in, what's interesting, actually, Mick, we're going to catch a fish because there's. A million of them out there at the minute. Well, I wouldn't might have caught one then if that had not attacked my foot. Yeah. <laughs> foot. <laughs> Look at you, like nervous, twitching. Well, they're there, aren't the, they? Um, but this is the perfect example of why we have to carry many floats because it's gone flat calm all of a sudden. It yeah. hasn't been like this for two hours while we've been doing this video. And now, you, if you put a foam on it, it'd be the, it'd be the right float. Yeah, because you can control it, you can cast it. Because that's quite a loud float, that is. Even though it doesn't look that loud, it yeah. is. Not that it bothered him. No, he still <laughs> came to it, didn't he? <laughs> oh, he's taking line. Calm down. Yeah. <laughs> they don't like it, Captain. What a brilliant method, though, Mick. It's, um, I want to say that you've got everything in one package here with this method. Mm. What I mean is that you get to watch a float. Yeah. You get the you get your string pulled as it as it were, yeah. like you would be if you were method feeder fishing. All the excitement, anticipation, and work rate. You're yeah. certainly going to be ready for your dinner when you've had a session on this, aren't you? Yeah. Because it's, it's got that technical aspect that she's so enjoyable. The different floats, the different yeah. setups, and without a doubt, great, great way to fish. I mean, I've I've learnt a lot because obviously it proved that I've sat there watching you talking through what you've done, you've talked me through what you've done, I've repeated it to the viewers, and um, even the helicopters have come to see us, um, and I'll just wait for that helicopter to fly by. Is he part of our film crew? No. <laughs> um, That's our drone, our new drone. Yeah. And when I sat down on, on the box, it was quite obvious that I'd not listened as well as I thought I had because I started to do it slightly wrong. I, I tried to f feed after I'd cast and not got my rod rest in the right place. And I think that that just proves that you can tell people how to do things, but the best way is to sit down, yes. practice it, work through it. And get the iron out of those little wrinkles. Yeah, and get, get the information, but make sure that you're making it work for you. So take fundamentals from these videos and that's a nice fish to end on. He's a great fish, yeah. And put it into practice. And that will definitely improve your catch rate because clearly, with guidance from you, even I've caught a few, and certainly what you've said to me is massive. So but it's actually working, isn't it? There's no Oh no, you can no, see uh, you can see that everything you've said is Oh, be careful with him. Uh, everything you've said to me is, is bang on. Yeah. And I can see it in practice. Yep. So, take note, everybody. Listen to what Joe tells you. Wow. Well, and catch loads, I'm don't sure you? you'll catch a lot of fish on a brilliant method at a cracking venue like this. 
And it but, is a cracking venue, isn't it? Oh, it's amazing. What's not to love? I mean, Wayne, the new owner, I'm sure he'll take this place from strength to strength. It's, um, it's already a brilliant venue, and I'm sure it's going to get better. So, thanks very much, Joe. I've learnt tons. I hope everybody else has too. Yeah. And we've, we've, just, we've just gone over 10,000 subscribers. So I believe. Unbelievable, so, isn't it? It's obviously, if you enjoy our videos, join the 10,000 people, like and subscribe, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. And I'll let you know in secret, he's got snagged. Yeah, don't tell anybody. <laughs> stay try, try and pretend it's not. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs>